Can you guys talk for a minute? There we go. We got. Uh, we got hello. Hey, okay. hello. Hello. Purple, yellow. And good evening, folks. And uh, I guess we're live. Here we are. So welcome back to the page. It's Chris Kerwin here with Astronomy by the Bay. And of course, I have back with us tonight, uh, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. And we've got uh, Mr. Paul Owen from Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey. Evening. We're not showing on Facebook yet. We're not showing on Facebook yet. We should be momentarily. And I see a couple of people answering hi. So there we go, live. Okay. Yeah, we're, okay. Up. Yeah, we're, we're usually about a couple yep. minute delay anyway. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We're up and, we're up and running. That's always a good thing. Our sponsors are working good, Scotty. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday night astronomy show. Uh, first of all, welcome back uh, to Mike and uh, Paul. Mike from the PFO Observatory here in St. John and Paul from Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton, both amateur astronomers just like myself who just enjoy sharing uh, this hobby together. Uh, okay, so we've got a number of things lined up for you this evening. Um, Paul is going to provide us uh, with a talk on how to clean those precious optics. From binoculars to eyepieces to telescopes, clean optics are an essential part of enjoying the views. But cleaning them properly is also very important to be sure that you protect your investment. And Paul's going to show us how to make your investment last by how to uh, properly uh, clean all those devices. Probably won't get into cleaning eyeglasses too much, eh? Okay. Well, I can show you how I do it. Well, there, okay. <laughs> well, take two seconds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and also tonight, uh, have you ever wondered, uh, wanted to try and capture those shooting stars while you sleep? Uh, well, on Mike's new Mike, Mike Giver segment, he's going to tell, give us all the details on how to build and use your own all-sky camera. Uh, then Paul's going to present our Rosanna's Fun Facts, the segment, the segment, along with a, a bit of a talk about uh, the night sky through a short reading that he's going to do. I'll be starting out with the talk on uh, what's up in space this week, um, and we'll have uh, our other usual segments as well, of course. Uh, and then I'm going to end up with a what's up in the night sky this coming week, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the nice comet that's in our sky right now, in our morning sky. Mm -hmm. So we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, comet uh, Neowise. So sit back and enjoy, folks, and remember this is a live broadcast, so if you have any questions about the night sky or telescopes or equipment, uh, we're happy to try to answer them here for you. So let's get started, I guess, with the talk about uh, what's new in space this week. And that'll be up to me, won't it? It is. It is, okay. Let's see if I can get my notes together. What's up in space this week? Okay, let's get back to a few photos here. I'll have to see where I'm going to share my screen, first of all. I'm going to go to full screen here and make sure I'm full screen out on Facebook. Should be good there. And now I want to try to share my screen. And I guess I'm going to share this one. And that's going to do that kind of crap until I get my pictures up here. There we go. Alrighty. Oh. I'm going to drag it over. There you go. Let's make sure that it's coming up on Facebook as well. It is? Yep. Okay. Great. Well, uh, a balloon ride to the edge of space could soon be a reality. A company in the USA is planning to offer balloon rides to a place where very few people have gone before. Space Perspectives, a Florida-based startup, wants to start balloon rides from the Earth to the edge of space. The company is planning to use an advanced balloon called the Spaceship Neptune that will fly customers to the edge of space within the next few years. The human spaceflight company has scheduled its test flight for Space Neptune for early 2021. And I thought I had another photo here. Maybe I do. There it is. Just bring that one over too. I'm just did these in paint. Yeah. Um, while the test flight will not have a crew, the startup hopes to begin commercial flights within the next few years. Uh, the, slight, uh, the sightseeing jaunts to the outer reaches of Earth's atmosphere will take place within a pressurized capsule that will also feature refreshments, a refreshments bar and a lavatory. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> Space poop. <laughs> All right. According to the company's website, mm -hmm. flights, when they begin, will carry eight explorers and a pilot. 
three times higher than a commercial airline flies, which is about 100,000 feet above the Earth. Customers will be able to enjoy a view of sunrise from the edge of space during the six-hour journey before descending back to Earth, where a ship will retrieve the capsule, balloon, and explorers. The company explained that it has not yet set a price on tickets, but they will likely sell for around $125,000 initially. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for that opportunity. I don't know if they take Visa. <laughs> 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 well, you can try, Mike, with yours, no problem. Well, you could join Space Force, and they could just get out there whenever you want. There you well, go. There, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Let me see if I can do, just open it up with uh, something else. Uh, that would be open it with uh, photos. Yes, I, I was wondering how they got it down, but I guess, uh, you know, you're, you're strapping your butt to a balloon and going 100,000 feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hoping the balloon doesn't burst. <laughs> yeah, you're hoping for sure. Or, or you might need that lavatory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hope it's got a seatbelt. <laughs> uh, earlier this year, the Neowise Space Telescope discovered its latest comet, a distant and inconspicuous object. At the time of its discovery on March the 27th, the comet, dubbed Comet Neowise, short for Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, they got to squeeze all that in there to try to get a yeah, yeah. <laughs> to try to get a name that fits right, and it was cataloged as C twenty twenty F three. It was located three hundred twelve million kilometers from the sun and shining at a very faint magnitude of uh, seventeen. That's about twenty five thousand times fainter than the faintest star that can be glimpsed with the naked eye. It was only visible with very large telescopes. But in July, Comet Neowise has raised hopes that it will become a tantalizing object for sky watchers after two previous comets, Atlas and Swan, fizzled out earlier this year. Uh, an object uh, magnitude is measurement of an object's brightness in the sky. The lower the magnitude, the brighter the object. The brightest stars in the sky are around zero or first magnitude. The faintest stars visible to the eye on a dark, clear night are sixth magnitude. First magnitude stars are 100 times brighter than those that are sixth magnitude. Right now, the comet is approaching a magnitude one. But will it get even brighter? Well, we think so. We're not quite sure yet. Um, let me try this one again. With photos. Here's, these are both uh, shots by uh, Chris Schoen. He's a astrophotographer. He took these out just the other day in Arizona, actually. <clears throat> Uh, Comet Neowise survived its close approach, closest approach to the Sun, or its perihelion, unlike its 2020 predecessors, comets Atlas and Swan. All the way into its approach to the Sun, Neowise displayed a perfectly circular and well-condensed well head, or coma, compared to the faint, wispy, almost ghostly coma displayed by Comet Atlas and the hammerhead, looking coma of Comet Swan, which foretold a possible breakup. As it turned out, both of these objects indeed faded away long before either reached the vicinity of the Sun. Well, before Neowise's solar arrival on Friday, this past Friday, veteran Australian comet watcher Michael Matazio was con confident that Neowise would be re remain intact, giving at least a 70% chance that it would survive its close brush with the Sun. And apparently it did. The comet was 27.3 uh, million miles or 44 million kilometers from the Sun on July 3rd. When it was subjected to temperatures of up to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit or 593 degrees Celsius. Thereafter, rapid motion to the northeast and the east, owing to the comet's sharp orbital inclination to the orbital plane of the planets, will quickly carry it away from the Sun's vicinity in the days to follow. It's about a 10,000 year period comet, this one. And we're going to talk a bit about more about that, uh, where, to, where, when to look in my What's Up talk a little bit later on. So that's Comet Neowise. Keep an eye out for that one. So let's take a little look at SpaceX, I guess, maybe next. SpaceX's next Starlink mission, which everybody really enjoys, right? <laughs> hey, everybody. Mm -hmm. Is now scheduled for July the 8th. The launch initially scheduled for June 23rd would have been SpaceX's third Starlink launch in less than three weeks. However, the mission was subjected to no less than four delays in the course of one week. The launch was moved from the 23rd to June 24th, and then the 25th of June, and then the 30th of June. A revised date for Starlink's 10th 
dispatch has now been set for July the 8th, 2020, if the weather plays long. The launch will take place from LC-39A at the uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, with liftoff scheduled for uh, 1600 Greenwich Mean Time, or um, I think it's 1 o'clock uh, uh, Eastern Daylight Time. For this mission, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is expected to launch the 10th batch of approximately 60 satellites for SpaceX's Starlink broadband network, a mission des uh, designated Starlink 9. As reported by Spaceflight Now, two Earth observation microsatellites for Black Sky Global, a Seattle-based company, will launch as rideshare payloads on this mission. This mission will incorporate SpaceX's new VisorSat devices as well. Um, we talked about those a little bit in one of our previous shows. And uh, this is one of them right here with the visor sat installed on it. So these uh, devices here flip up and uh, they prevent, uh, they're designed to reduce the visibility of the satellites from Earth. Um, so that's something that astronomers were looking for. We'll have to wait and see what effect this has on the much enjoyed satellite trains, of course. And as times uh, for the past has become available, I'll be posting up on my Facebook and Instagram pages once uh, once they are released. The calculations haven't been made yet. Uh, they're usually made uh, usually a day before launch. Um, so launch is on the 11th, so I expect the day before I'll, I'll see some calculations made for the orbits and the passes, and I'll pass all that information on at that time. And finally, Sir Isaac Newton. Oh, hang on. I meant to open him with a photo. This is not Sir Isaac Newton. Looks like himself. Kermit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> not Sir Isaac Newton himself, but <laughs> <laughs> Sir Isaac Newton was famous for developing th the three laws of motion, of course, and advancing calculus, apparently had a far out idea about how to treat the plague, also called the Black Death, by using toad vomit lozenges. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to recommending a number of gemstone amulets against the plague, he gave detailed instructions on how to make the putrid toad vomit treatment, according to two unpublished pages, handwritten by Newton, that are now on the auction block. Newton describes in detail how to suspend the toad by its legs in a chimney for three days <laughs> until it vomits up earth with various insects in it. This vomit must be caught on a dish of yellow wax, he added. After the toad dies, its body should be turned into powder, mixed with the vomit, and a serum made into lozenges. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> and warn about the affected area. <laughs> oh, warn about the affected area. Okay. <laughs> glad, glad it wasn't those other kind of lozenges. I know, uh, licking toads get you high, maybe you <laughs> yeah, feel better. Makes <laughs> you know like, about this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Turn you into a prince. Uh, <laughs> That's this, one good looking toad. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, this treatment would drive away the contagion <laughs> and draw out the poison, Newton wrote. Uh, the toad treatment was best if. Uh, hang on a second, get up the other drawing area on it. Um, this guy. Uh, this is his actual manuscript right here. The toad treatment was best, but if someone was in a pinch, then amulets made out of the gemstones, hyacinth, sapphire, or, or amber could also serve as antidotes. Newton and his contemporaries didn't know that the plague didn't respond to toad vomit or gems. It wasn't until 1894 that the French Swiss scientist Alexander Yersin learned that the disease is caused by a bacterium, which was later named Yersinia, in his honor. Oh, that's nice. Have a bacterium named after you. Uh, <laughs> these, days, nice. these days, the plague is treated with antibiotics, not vomit from toads that were hung upside down. Uh, in 1936, though, Newton's plague manuscript was sold along with a vast trove of, of his other writings in Sotheby's uh, Portsmouth sale. But these two pages were uncovered only recently after being lost for more than 70 years, according to Bonhams. Bidding is currently set at $65,000, and it went on until June the 10th. There's been no information yet on the winning bid. And that's what's up in space this week. Wow. So there. Mmm, toad vomit. Um... <laughs> I think that idea probably got towed right out of there. <laughs> uh, you <yeah, I> think? <laughs> so did that joke. <laughs> well, let's yeah. hop along with the next segment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's hop along the next segment. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. I knew that was coming. Oh, that's good. Okay. So, <laughs> what is our next segment? Anyway, that'll be Mike. 
No, that'd be Paul. Paul's going to talk to us about pop. <laughs> I'm all confused. I think he's all that toad. I think he's been looking at toad. <laughs> Who's been looking at toad? <laughs> Ooh. Anyway. Oh, my. That's good, Chris. I don't know yeah. where you're coming up with it, but it's good. I don't know. They take a lot of research, yeah. believe me. Yeah. <laughs> there, there really aren't a whole lot of funny space stories out there. Imagine. Oh, my. Anyway, okay. okay. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to get you to carry it away. Then, I guess um, we're going to talk all about. Uh, how do I? How do I follow that? <laughs> I'm knee sure. deep in my. Uh... There you go. Knee deep. Knee deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> if anybody could follow it, you can. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so I guess <laughs> I don't know how to follow that, but I'm going to try. Okay. okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, cleaning optics and when do we need to clean optics and should we clean optics. Um, it's one of the biggest things that people get into when they first get telescopes because they want them as clean and crisp and as beautiful as the day that they come out of the box. But in the real world, reality is optics don't stay clean and crisp. And as soon as you get them out of the box, they start collecting little bits of whatever's in the air. So um, so you've got to say to yourself, okay, so do I clean that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I remember when I got my first telescope and I thought, you know what? I, I did what the, the, the worst thing in the world you could do. What is it, Mike? <laughs> you looked at the optics, didn't you? With a flashlight. A with a flashlight. Look into the optics with a flashlight. That's the first thing I did. I took the took the flashlight and I looked at the mirror or at the lens and it was like, oh my God, look at that. Oh, I have to clean it. Yeah. And uh, that's basically the worst thing you can do. So never ever take your flashlight and shine it into your optics unless you want to think that the world is the world of sky is falling and it's really not falling at all. <laughs> And I want to show you a couple examples of why I say that. <clears throat> so let me see if I if I've got them here. Um, shrink about a million things here. Hopefully, I can find them again when I need them. Okay, so I'm going to open up something, and I want to show you something I I posted on my Facebook page a long time ago, and I thought tonight's topic would be just absolutely perfect for this. Whoops. Okay, I'm going to share my screen or try to. And it should be this one. Share. And I'm going to show you this picture first. So, can you see that picture of that bird? Mm -hmm. Picture of the bird? You see a picture of a bird? No? Nope, not yet. You haven't. You haven't oh, sorry. Picture of the bird. Sorry, oh, bird. There, there it is. He flew with the other side. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he was chasing that toad, right? <laughs> <laughs> and who wouldn't, right? <laughs> and I had to tow him back. Anyway, so this picture of the bird, what do you think of it? Do you see anything wrong with that photograph? Other than the fact that it's a bird looking at you with some seed in his mouth and you're saying, what are you looking at me? Because I could see some mouth. I'm hungry. Leave me alone. But do you see anything wrong with the photograph itself? Yeah, a little blurry in the bottom. Top. Yeah, that's fine. That's that's just a focal oh, thing. Oh, well, sorry. Okay, <laughs> nothing really. Yeah, that's yeah. a picture, right? <laughs> no, that's okay. nothing wrong. Okay, so then what about this picture? Now, here's a picture of a chimney. Um, nothing great, but I wanted to see, first of all, do you see anything wrong with that picture other than the fact that we don't see the whole house? We just see a chimney and a roof. Chimney probably should be repointed. <laughs> there you go. Missing a few bricks. Missing a few bricks, but we all are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it, realistically, that looks like a pretty good picture of chimney, right? So what about this picture here? Do you see anything wrong with that? Nothing? Just well, nothing. I don't know if the dirt's on the siding or if the dirt's on the lens. <laughs> <laughs> Learn from my computer screen. <laughs> you know, yeah, just clean your screen, Mike, because yeah. there's no dirt on the <laughs> <side>. <laughs> So really, there's nothing wrong with any of those pictures, right? They all look pretty darn good. Well, let me show you what I took it through. That. Yeah. Sure. Every one of those pictures you see, I use that telescope with that kind of crud. Actually, that's actually scrap scrapings on the inside of one of the lenses. And uh, and I just stuck a camera in the end of it. It's a, I think it's a 100-millimeter telescope. And I took all of those pictures with that. 
and uh, and you couldn't see anything wrong with those pictures that I showed you, right? And the whole point of this exercise was to show you that if you can get pictures like that through a lens that looks like this, then, you know, when you see a little bit of dust and stuff on your optics, don't worry about it because you're never going to see it. And the reason is, is because the focal point is not on the glass. The focal point is way down by your eyepiece, up into your eye. That's where the focal point is. All that, all the, that the glass does is collect the light and send it down. If the thing was, if the focal point was on the glass, then you would see it. But it's not on the glass. It's way down the other end of the telescope. So, um, so if you've got some dust on your um, uh, on your lens, if you've got some dew drops, uh, you know, uh, from rain, maybe a couple of raindrops got on it. You know, maybe just some dust or that kind of stuff. Don't worry about it because it's not going to affect your optical, uh, your views. And if you're using it for imaging, it's not going to affect your imaging. Not on that end of the scope that we call the business end. So, um, so I wanted to show you that before we talked about. Um, um, let me just get that off there now, and I'll stop sharing. And there we go. I'm back. Okay. So. So yeah, so I want to show you that just to show you how bad it can actually get. And still not any kind of, any kind of... Oh, what am I hearing? Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> that was my phone. Sorry. Oh, somebody got mail. Somebody got mail. You want to get <laughs> ignore? <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah. So again, so don't worry about it. But we do have to keep our our products clean from time to time, and there is a time when you need to clean your optics. And let me just get my thing back up here again. There we go. So, um, so basically, when you clean your optics, there are first of all, there's different approaches to the the, the type of optics that are out there. So, when we're talking about cleaning optics, we're we're going to talk about cleaning eyepieces. We're going to talk about uh, cleaning uh, telescopes. And we're going to talk a little bit about cleaning refractors. And there's different types of telescopes that are out there. There are lens type of telescopes, which are like the um, um, refractors. And some of the smith cassegrain telescopes that actually have a corrector lens on the front of them, that can all be cleaned the same way that you would clean a refractor, because those are actual black surfaces that can clean your lenses. Um, and then there's mirrors. And the mirrors are basically in... Um, the Newtonian type telescopes like the Dobsonians or the reflectors, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, and that's a totally different beast. So you, you clean those two different ways with, um, with, with mirrors from reflectors. Uh, they have to be taken out of the telescope itself. Uh, the column comes right out and then they have to actually be put in, um, in a tub or a sink and actually be washed with, uh, with just a little bit of, um, I use Dawn. Uh, soap detergent, just one drop in the water, and then you just use cotton balls and you just give it a nice cleaning that way there. And then when you rinse it, you just get some distilled water, pour it on that, and then take a hair dryer after that and dry off the surface. And whenever dew droplets are left, you just take a little piece of tissue and you just dab wherever the little drops are. That essentially is how you would clean a mirror um, for a Newtonian. But for cleaning... Um, uh, surfaces on lenses, it's a different kind of cleaning at all, uh, cleaning altogether. And it's the same if you're going to clean your camera lens, and uh, it's going to be the same sort of approach. Um, a lot of people are afraid to clean their lenses, the cameras, uh, or their telescopes, or their eyepieces, because they think they're going to damage um, the coatings that are on there. And you can damage them if you really go at them and purposely try to damage them. But if you take uh, some of these short steps that I'm going to show you how to do, um, you won't damage anything and you'll get a nice clean surface pretty much every time. So, um, so let's just get right into it. Um, so what you're going to need to begin with is you're going to need um, an air blower like this. And all that does is just you know, just blow some air. So it's like a little, a little mini bellows, or you can buy a kit like this. It's called an optics cleaning kit. And this is made by Orion. And inside this kit is everything you need to do a nice job <clears throat> on, <clears throat> excuse me, on all of your optics. This one here, it's actually got a can of um, Dust Pro, which is a, a, a basically it's an aerosol can to blow away um, all the dust. You also get... Um, 
your bottle of cleaning fluid, and this is a fluid that's designed specifically for uh, for lenses for the for those coatings, uh, whether it be for your camera, whether it be for your eyepiece, or for your um, uh, telescope. It also comes with um, a brush, which is all the good ones are made of basically camel hair, just a really, really, really soft brush. If you can go to your wife's, uh, <laughs> go to her makeup kit, you could probably scooch one from her. Uh, don't tell her you took it and make sure she didn't use it. And, uh, but anyway, it's just a little brush there so that you can, uh, you can clean the optics. So you'll need, you'll need one of those. And I'll show you the, the progression, how to use all that stuff. You'll also get, um, usually you'll get some uh, little cotton swabs in there. And you'll also get um, some actual cleaning paper, which is really, really finite, see-through uh, paper. You can actually see right through that. And uh, that kind of paper that you'll use to uh, both clean and to, and to dry the, the surface of the optics. And those are basically what you get into that little kit. And again, this is kit that's made by um, Orion and it's called the Optics Cleaning Kit. And it's about $30, I think I paid for that. $34.95, there it is there. And uh, if you wanna buy all these things separately, you know, go to the dollar store, places like that, you could probably put together a kit, you know, probably for, you know, $10, $15, no doubt. But I just, I was at the scope shop, I had one, so I took it, right? Anyway, so that's what's in there. So. First things first, so if you want to clean a lens, um, an eyepiece, I have a two inch eyepiece here that actually I cleaned this afternoon just to make sure my theory was gonna work, <laughs> and it did. So what you'll do first, um, if you have some dirt on an eyepiece, what you're gonna get on an eyepiece first of all, if you're out there and you're sharing your telescope, you're probably gonna get some uh, eyelash oil or some stuff from people's eyes if they get in there close enough to it. You're gonna get some dust on there, you're gonna get dew, you're gonna get drops of uh, water or moisture of a sort, and you'll get all kinds of stuff like that on there. And I had all that on on, the, on this particular eyepiece this afternoon, and I, and I cleaned it first to make sure that this would work. So I'm gonna show you exactly what I went through to clean this. So if you look at it now, I don't know if you can see in there, but you'll see that that eyepiece is like super clean. There's nothing on it now at all. And this afternoon it was full of guck, it was full of uh, um, water droplets, it was full of all kinds of stuff. So here's exactly what I did. So the first thing you want to do if you're going to clean your eyepieces is you're going to want to remove the eye uh, um, rubber so that you can get close and have no, no obstructions to get in to the actual glass itself. So once you've got that done, there's one of two things you're going to do. If you have the blower like this, you're going to take your eyepiece and you're going to hold it downwards not like this, because if you just blow it like this and hold it upwards and squeeze this, you're just blowing dust around, but it's gonna settle right back on the glass. So turn your glass down like this, take your little blower in there and just start blowing it like that and give it a good, give her a good run. Make sure that, you know, you're getting all the dust that's, that's out of there. Because sometimes when you look in and you think you've got spots on your glass, in actual fact, all it is is dust, and sometimes all you have to do is just blow the dust off and you're good to go again. So the reason I'm showing you this, um, in, this in the sequence I'm showing you is because you really should only clean to the point where you, have, where you can stop. If all of a sudden I'm doing this and I do my, um, I use the blower and all the dust is gone and so my lens is clean again, surprisingly enough, then I'm gonna stop there. I don't have to go any further. But if I do that and I see spots that are still on there, well, I've gotta to go to phase two. So I've done it first of all with this. The second way you can do it is if you have the actual uh, can of the blower right here. And I wanna show you something that's very important about this type of aerosol, is if you're gonna use this, make sure that you blow it a couple times first so that any kind of um, moisture particulate that's in there that's not quite settled, it'll blow out first. And once that's out, then you're good to go. The technique to you for this is do not shake it, do not move it around when you're blowing the air because the moisture that's in there will come out of this and you will actually have to clean that off of your glass and you don't want to do that. So the technique is to blow it a couple of times there. I, just, I don't know if you saw that, but there's some, mo some moisture just came out of that just from that little shake that I did. And I'm just going to hold it straight. I'm not going to move my hand at all. This is staying right in place. Then I'm going to take that, I'm going to put it on the glass. 
there. So now what I've done is I've taken with that that um, that aerosol and I've blown out anything that's relatively loose on there that the air can take off is now gone. So we're good. So we're done that step. Step number two. Now you're going to take that little camel hairbrush you took from your wife's makeup kit. <laughs> so basically what it again, you can get when you, you can actually go to like Lawton's or any of the shoppers or places like that. And you can buy these and just tell them that you're looking for a camel hairbrush. They'll take you to a section and there's all kinds of different sizes and lengths. Some are really nice with wood handles, you know, whatever the case, but you want something that you can put in a case and put away so that it doesn't collect dust, that kind of stuff. So just give it a little, just a little bit of a, a shake before you use it. Then after you've done using the air on this, then you're going to take and just gently, anything that's on there that didn't come off, this little brush, as you can see, I'm cleaning it there now. This little brush will get rid of and loosen any other dust and dirt that's on there. So once you've done this and you've loosened anything up that maybe got a little loose at the time, then you're going to want to do that one more time. Now you know you're totally clean of anything that could be abrasive. And the reason that you're doing this is that when you're actually cleaning the surfaces uh, with uh, the swabs or, the, or the, uh, the, the paper, is you don't want to take anything that can actually be dragged across the surface and scratch your coatings. That's what you're trying to avoid. That's why we do these steps first. Okay, so once we've got that done, then our next thing that we're going to do, put my brush away, is I'm going to get my, um, I'm going to get my cleaner out. So I'm going to use the little cleaning fluid that came with it. So when I'm doing an eyepiece, there's not a lot of glass surface to begin with. Even that one there I'm using is a two inch. There's not that much surface. So um, I'm going to use cotton swabs on it because the reason I use uh, cotton swabs on this, this one today was because I had water droplets all over the place. And uh, so I want to get rid of them. So the best way to get rid of them is to use a cotton swab. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your cotton swab and then you're going to take your fluid and then you're just going to put a couple of drops. Now, there, you got to remember which end you're using that's wet, which end you're using that's dry, because once you're done using the wet solution, you're going to want to dry it off at the other end. So you just take your, your solution, and I always put just a couple of drops, and I round it out. It's not sopping wet, but it's wet enough. It's going to leave a nice water streak. Then you just go into your eyepiece, and you look for where you might see a, a spot that's dirty. And then you would just start to do a circular motion with it. And you're going to do that. And when you create that circular motion, I don't know if you can see it in there, but uh, yeah, you can see that blotch that's up there now near the top. That's basically just the wetness of this fluid that's on, the, that's on that spot. Once I've got that done, then I'm going to take the opposite side, which is the dry side. And then I'm just going to, as I'm doing a little motion like this, I'm doing a little circular motion. At the same time, if I'm going, if I'm circle, circling this way, I'm spinning my Q-tip that way, okay? Because what I'm doing is, is as I'm doing that, I'm cleaning the surface and I'm turning it, which is pulling off any dirt or, or uh, debris that might be there. So I'm just doing that. And as I'm doing that little circular motion, I'm t I'm always, I've always got that thing in, in, a, in, a, in a spinning mode. And what that does is that as I clean that surface, there we go. That's looking really, really good. Really good. Okay, so once I've got that done, now I know I'm spot free. I'm just going to repeat that as many times as I need to get all the different spots off of the off the glass. Once it's clean and I, and I like the result that I got, then I can just simply take um a nice microfiber cloth i got a brand new one here which i never used before so tonight's going to be the night and you just take your microfiber cloth put your finger in behind it like so make sure there's no creases or anything like that it's a nice round soft surface and very gently just basically just do a circular motion as if you were cleaning a camera lens and you just do that that's going to pick up any le leftover moisture any debris and by and again it's just you're just touching it with maybe just a tiny tiny little bit of pressure so that you know you're picking stuff up and once you've got all that done that is as just as nice as a brand new piece of glass as you find anywhere super clean 
and it's ready for another, you know, couple, three, four, and five nights, six nights of observing or longer, depending if it's just you or not. If you're out doing outreach, well, that's a different story. We always get dirty lenses from there. But in any way, that's how you clean an eyepiece. So it's really, really simple to do. Um, once you've got it clean, of course, put your um, you put your lens hood, your car eye piece protector back on your eye cup holder, or eye cup, I guess to call it. And now I'm good for another night of observing. So that's how you clean a, an eyepiece. Pretty straightforward. Any questions yet before I go on to? Nothing showed up yet. Nothing? Okay, good. No, I haven't seen anything yet. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean uh, my telescope. This is really simple. And these are the only two things I'm gonna clean because really the techniques that I'm showing you here are good for your eyepieces, your telescopes, uh, whether they be refractors or they be um, uh, Smith Gasser Green, the, just just the the, the the corrector lens in the front, and uh, and this little telescope. And if I can get out of here, I'll bring my little telescope up. Okay, so there we are. So again, um, this is the thing that most people are afraid of is cleaning that piece of glass in there. Now I'm gonna should I stand back further, put my scope a little camera a little higher, maybe. Yeah, there. Can you pop that dew cover right off? Yep. So when you first get your telescope, um, when you first look at it, sometimes there's a dew cap on the front of them. If there is, it's usually retractable back and forth or it's removable one or the other. This one here, like, like Mike was saying, this one's actually removable. So that one just pulls right off. So now I have, I can put my hand right on my glass. No problem. So I can get right in there. So again, um, let's say I've had this telescope and I've had it out for, you know, a number of nights, and it's been that time of year where you get a lot of dew at night, and in the daytime it's ripping hot, and maybe we're doing some public observing. Some cars have gone by, there's been dust in the air, and a little bit of that's collecting on your thing. So now we know that, okay, you know what, I can still see through it, like I showed you at the beginning of this segment, but um, but I really want it clean. I, I, want, I want to get rid of that. I don't want it to build. So if I do want to clean it, okay, let's do it. So the first thing we're going to do is if we have our little bubble, if that's what we're using, we give just a spray. And if, if it's on a mount like this, do it downwards so the air goes down and it gets away from the glass. If you're using the uh, condensed air, again, make sure you see no nothing coming out of it and then straight. So now our glass is clean of any debris that may have been there that will come off simply with the movement of air. Second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our little, our uh, uh, camel hair brush, and then we're gonna simply wipe that glass and make sure that there's no debris on there and anything that you can possibly remove with this by very gentle strokes, we're not forcing it, we're not grinding, we're just using basically the weight of the actual brush itself, just like if you were, if you were doing a gentle painting, and then that's it. So now we get that debris off. So any debris that may have come off with that brush, we just simply do another little blow of air and make sure we are particle free. Once we are particle free, this is gonna be a little different procedure. It's gonna be the same procedure, but we're gonna use different materials. So when I'm cleaning a surface that's this big, I'm not going to use the Q-tips unless all I'm going after are water spots. If I'm going after water spots, I'll do the Q-tip routine, and that'll be just great. But if I'm going after a total clean and, and I really want to clean the whole surface of this, then I'm going to use these paper, um, these paper cleansers. So basically what I do with this is I take it, I fold it once, I fold it twice, and I fold it one more time. So now I've got something that'll actually, when I put the fluid on the on the paper, it'll stay on the paper and it won't just dis, you know disintegrate and go away. So I'll just drop one, two, three, four, five, just enough to soak one edge, one edge of the paper. Once I've got that on there, then I simply just go into my lens and I start from the outer edge and then circular motion and I take it down. I flip this around, so now I'm using the other edge, and I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna go from the, that side, and I'm gonna work my way up. And then I'm gonna just take this one more time, because it's still wet, but I'm gonna use the inside. And the reason I'm doing all this is I'm trying to avoid anything that got on here. I don't wanna wipe it around there again. And then I'm just gonna do the center. 
like so. Once I've got that done, now I know that my lens is free of all the dirt, debris, dust, fingerprints, and that, but I still see a lot of water droplets from the, from the uh, materials I'm using. So then I'm going to take another one of these papers, and I'm going to do a drying procedure, which is pretty much the same thing. I'm just going to fold it once, fold it twice. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shrink this one way down because I want more of a surface on this. And then I'm going to do the same sort of thing where I'm just going to gently use my finger, and I'm just going to start to fold this down as I use it. So I'm using a different surface each time I, go, I apply it. And now my lens is now moisture free. There's no more moisture on there. I may see some streaks on there and you would see through those streaks. If you want to stop here, you can. Uh, but if you don't want to, if you want the streaks gone too, that's when you're going to use your microfiber cloth. So then you're going to take your microfiber cloth and you're simply going to put it in there. Um, you're going to use maybe a couple of fingers on the back end of it like this. So you're just putting your fingers in behind so that you've got a surface. You're not going to push. You're just going to drag the cloth around. And then you're just going to do some circular uh, cleaning like this, the same way that you would clean a uh, camera lens, the same exactly thing. Just remember that what we're trying to do is protect the coatings that are out, that's on the glass because it's the coatings that keep the, uh, the lens um, anti-reflective. So that when you're looking at bright objects, you don't get all these funny star shaped or streaky uh, um, artifacts because you don't have anything stopping all that, all that uh, glare, if you will. And that's really what the coating's designed designed to do is to keep that glare from going in. So that when you're looking at something bright, like a really bright star or the edge of the moon, um, you've got some coatings on there that are going to keep things, you know, um, uh, let all the light pass through, but at the same time take take care of any kind of uh, uh, reflectivity that you want to you want to avoid. Once you've got that done. There is an absolutely clean, super crispy looking, just beautiful, like from the factory lens that you will have with your telescope um, if you need to do that. Once you've got that done, simply put your put your uh, your hood back on, put your cap on, and then you're ready for uh, another long period of time uh, of observing before you have to clean the lens again. So that's pretty much it. That's how you do it. Hey, Paul, so would, would you have the same procedure, say, on your 8-inch scope back there? Yes. The, the only difference being, um, if I'm going to do my smith cassegrain because, again, the smith cassegrain on the front of, the ca of, of that telescope, there's a lens. So I'm going to take off the cover of the scope. I'm going to do the blow technique first with a, with a hand with a bellows, or if I've got a compressed air, I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to take the brush, do exactly the same thing, and I'm going to do exactly what I showed you on that a refractor is I'm going to do on that, except I'm using a bigger surface. So it's my technique of cleaning because I'm doing a larger surface. I have to follow a certain pattern and work my, I usually work from the outside, working in towards the, the, um, uh, the secondary mirror. So, but it's, it's all done in sort of half height, half circle. So if I'm doing the whole surface like this, I'll start on the top and I'll work until I go until I go down to the bottom. So so say from six o'clock or from twelve o'clock to six o'clock. Then I'll go from twelve o'clock over here down to this side at six o'clock. And then I'll get a little closer into the center and do the same thing. Closer in the center, do the same thing. And then I'll finally get right around the plate and do that. Once I've done that, then of course I'll just go ahead and um, and do it again with the drying technique. If there's streaks on there and I don't like the streaks, um, again I can go ahead and use a fiber cloth and just gently wipe those out. Uh, but it's pretty much the same technique. It's just a little different approach because it's a larger surface is all. Right. So Robert was saying, Robert Cadets here saying, I clean my corrector with one part distilled water and three parts of 99% alcohol and mm -hmm. using cotton balls, cleaning yeah. first and drying with clean cotton balls and let it sit for 15 minutes. So that's another another. That's another, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's and, a number of ways you can do it. Um, if you go to... Um, the uh, Star Arizona site, uh, that's the fellows down in California that make the hyper stars and, and, and that kind of stuff. They actually have right on their site of him actually cleaning that because that's what this guy does for a living is he actually builds um, this stuff. He's the guy that designed the hyper star that went on the ISS and he'll show you a technique to clean your corrector plate 
for Smit Castagrain. And it's a really, really simple procedure to follow. It's the one that I've used. It's the one I've learned. And it works extremely well. So yeah, there's lots of there's lots of products out there that you can purchase. I mean, yeah. that little tiny bottle that you had there probably wouldn't do a an 11 inch scope or something like that. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. You don't need a lot of the fluid um, to clean. Like this bottle here would probably do a couple of years uh, if you clean your scope quite regularly. For so sure. When, when should I drop my scope off to you? Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Scopes. Yeah. Oh. Line them up. Yeah, Line Mike up. Powell, I don't know. I don't know if I want to yeah. you know, take that same task on, but. I'm not Thank that fussy you. about dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and you shouldn't be, like I showed you in the beginning. Exactly. Exactly. That's perfect. Thanks, Paul. Let's pers- All right, appreciate that. Let's make sure there's any questions here. Let's uh, take a look out here. Any other questions for Paul before we uh, leave Paul and head over to Mike? Nothing, I guess. No. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks, Paul. All right. Uh-huh. So from yeah, well done. Uh, so from here, we'll probably go to Mike. Do you want to give us a talk next, or uh, I can do a couple of photo submissions. Doesn't matter. Pick one. Doesn't matter. Okay. We'll do the photo submission. That's just a short little one, and then we can lead lead right back into you again. Uh, so okay, let's let's get those lined up. So. Just need a second here to share my screen again. And as we mentioned before, we always enjoy getting your your photos. And we just had a couple this week, actually. Um, We had uh, one here from Irene Doyle, who's really a, a regular contributor to her page. Appreciate that, Irene. And one of the uh, Wax and Gibbous Moon here. She said it had a green tinge to it. She said she wasn't sure exactly why. I'm not ex- sure exactly why either. Paul, could you comment on that? Or, um, or uh, are you seeing it? Yes, I guess you are. Yeah. Let me, oh, just a second. I have to try to get onto it here. So if I can I see. Usually that's a white balance. Yeah, that's what that looks like to me. White just balance? Okay. It was um, uh, processed in whatever, however it was transferred. Mm-hmm. That's what it looks like. It just looks like the white balance is off a bit. Okay. So yep. she had another one here, I believe, pretty well the same. Yeah. Uh, Good picture, though. Yeah, yeah, nice picture. Yeah. There's the second one, yeah. So similar, yeah. Yeah, but great. Yeah, lot, lots of detail, though. Yeah. Yeah, really. That must have just been from the other night. Was it last night? Yeah, it was. Just yeah, uh, wax and gibbous. So it was just uh, the other day. Yeah. The other day, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Well done. And uh, we had here one from Jason uh, Dane. Who oh, placed this one, sent, sent me uh, a clip uh, or sent me a, a private message on it, but I said, well, why don't you send it in the page so we can put it up? So he did. So here's yeah. his shot oh, of the Eastern Vale. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, Eastern Vale. Mm. Lots of nice detail. Good that's job. What this new, that's with his new rig, eh? It, he, yeah. Uh, yeah, he just got a Skywatcher S3 100 and, um, and he got uh, his new Nebula filter. Uh, his, uh, I think he went with an L Enhance, and uh, so he took. Uh, he was out to somebody's place um, to get it to a dark sky, and he took this, uh, this, this, this image, and it turned out absolutely well worth the, the trip. Then, wow, yeah, uh, nice, very nice. I think it was his first photo too. He said so. Yeah. Which, yeah well, he's been doing, doing it for a while, but he's been using a camera lens, so he right. just got a telescope, and he does some great work. He's uh, a student of Ron Reacher. Oh, okay. Big um, uh, insight fellow, and he's he's done some amazing things. Excellent! Wow! Awesome! Nice job! Mm. And thanks for sending those in. Um, yeah, don't forget too that uh, you can send yours in to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail dot com. We love to get them. Um, and also, just wanted to mention one more time that uh, I've got a moon contest going on right now. So I am asking people to shoot the moon, send in your photos to uh to the contest and this is what's up for grabs right now so far uh 50 things to see with a telescope uh young gar- stargazer's guide and then the 50 things to tell see with telescope activity workbook which is really nice it's a nice laid out book that uh, allows you to get outside and sketch different uh projects throughout the book and write down whether you saw them or not what date and all that kind of stuff it's more like a log book uh, then we have 50 uh, animals that have been to space that was put out by Jennifer and John uh, both. John Reed is, uh, is a local author from uh, Nova Scotia or living in Nova Scotia right now. 
um, we just got his astrophysics uh, degree. And uh, we have the book Night Watch, which is a, a book I guess we've all uh, gone back to a number of times. And look at the look at the shot on the cover of Night Watch. Hey, what's up? <laughs> How ironic. There you go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's put out by Terrence Dickinson, which is a great uh, great book to uh, to get you started, um, beginning in the hobby, and um, something that you'll go back to and reference to quite a bit. And actually, has really nice star charts at the back as well that you, that light up really nicely with a red flashlight. And then the book uh, Deep Sky Wonders, put out by uh, Sky and Telescope, and that also has some nice star star charts at the back. But uh, that book actually gets into all the night sky treasures that are out there and goes through the month by month actually to show you what's up in the sky uh, each month. So a nice collection of prizes sitting there, just waiting for people to enter. And uh, I did say that if I had 100 entries, I'd add one more prize. We're not there yet. I'm only sitting in around 40 entries. So uh, get your photo in. It really doesn't take nothing. Go outside, take a picture of the moon. I know what's happening though lately is all this cloud. Really disappointing to me too. Uh, but the contest ends on July the 11th. So get an opportunity if you're out in the middle of the night, can't sleep, snap a photo of the moon, send it in. Nothing's being judged. All photos are treated equally. They all get tossed in the, uh, the draw. And these are the prizes that are up for grabs. Now all prizes have to be picked up in St. John as well. So uh, just to let you know. And uh, can Mike and I uh, get in on yeah, that? No, 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 sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have that night watch book, then you get a problem. <laughs> and I, I want to finally just uh, say uh, thank you so much to everybody who um, got me to uh, a magic number today. Oh, yes. So we reached uh, 9,000 followers on Facebook now. So thanks so much for all of your incredible support and uh, all of the support that we're getting out on YouTube as well as well as Instagram. So, um, yeah, just a nice milestone to get to, and we're pushing for 10,000 now. So, uh, Not that we're watching numbers, right? Not that we're watching numbers. No, <laughs> right, Mike? <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's, it's very exciting to, to reach a milestone like that. So It is. Uh, very just nice. to see that, uh, that the interest is there. So Perfect. Okay, so let's get back to you, Mike. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. And um, I'm going to let you take it over as soon as I get you brought up here. There we go. Get my hat straight. There we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <All set. laughs> uh, should I share my? Yeah, I shouldn't have to share my screen. I just see you, Chris. Yeah, um, you just see me. Okay. I'm clicked on you right now, so. Yeah, I see Mike. Yep. Okay, I'll go for it. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, how you build yourself uh, an all sky cam or uh, cloud cam, whatever you want to call it. Uh, everybody that you know gets their home observatory puts together starts thinking about the idea of having an all sky cam at some point in time. Uh, you can use them to photograph uh, meteors going by, try to catch that meteor going across the sky. Uh, you can now, you know, probably set it up and catch that Elon Musk uh, Skylink train going overhead as well and get a nice shot of that. But the more I got looking into these uh, all sky cams, the question became, you know, something like me, I can do it cheaper. I can I can do the same thing, and it won't cost me a penny. Now, it it's really quite simple. I'm not worried about having a 180 degree field or a 360 degree field of view lens, right? That goes from horizon to horizon. I'm just trying to catch a patch of sky. So maybe the proper term for mine should be a part-time cam or a part-sky cam as an all-sky cam. But I've built an all-sky cam using uh, a webcam like this one. It's uh, just so happens to be a high-definition, light-sensitive webcam. And, you know, I didn't do any modifications to it whatsoever. I basically stuck it into a, a like a camera shelter to keep it out of the, the – uh, the weather and stuff like that, and it worked perfectly fine. Just plugs into USB port, and you run software from there. But I did nowadays. Uh, ZWO and 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 these companies are coming out with these little webcams like this one. This is a one I bought on eBay. It's called a T7C, which is the equivalent to the ZWO 120 camera, and they come with a C mount, uh, 120 field of view camera lens. And that's exactly why they supply the camera lens for you. If you decide you want to use this camera, as, instead of using it as a guide camera, you can use it as an all-sky cam. And I thought, well, that's cool. Now, where do I go from there? So the first thing I did 
I went out and purchased it's a four inch to three inch PVC pipe coupling. I think it was uh, about uh, four dollars at Home Depot. And then I went rooting through the cupboard and found my wife had some candy trays that were exactly four inches in diameter. <laughs> they were flat glass uh, with, a, with you know, a little curve at the top to keep the candies from falling out. And all I did was electrical tape that to the top, and it sits in there perfect. And so now I can keep you know rain, snow, ice, and all that off the camera itself if I put the camera on the inside. So I thought, okay, there is basically the tube with the, something on the top to keep the weather out, to keep any reflections from going on inside. I took a piece of rubber that I had. I don't know what this rubber was off. It was an old tire tube or something like that, pretty thick truck tube, and I just cut it into a circle, and I shoved that up inside. I can get it here uh, and basically that gives me a black interior so I get no reflection off anything on the inside and then I take a piece of foam rubber just good old foam rubber nice squishy you can use pluck foam or anything like that and I take my camera I push it into the foam rubber and then that proceeds to go up into the, the camera behind that piece of rubber I put in there or uh, into the and if you look there's the camera in the bottom held nice and solid I can shake it nothing happens and there's the lens sticking through at the front and I'm pretty much ready to go <laughs> so now it's protected from the weather it's all sitting inside uh, some guys actually uh, I've seen them take and put uh, 12 volt adapters on them and shove a uh, dew heater uh, strap inside and that just keeps it warm so that it doesn't fog up on the inside and whatnot but uh, when you eventually uh, during the daytime it will clear off and you only really want to use it for night unless you're looking at airplanes so then I take my USB cable and it plugs into the camera piece of three inch PVC plastic pipe and this is just to sort of give it some room for the cable to go. So it gives my camera up a little bit. And then I added a cap on the bottom. I drilled a hole to shove the USB cable through. If it'll fit this time. Now I've got to go the other way. This is how you, you do it really, really cheaply. I'm trying to keep the parts from falling on the ground here. Shove that camera back up in there. And pull the cable through. And there, with two pieces of Velcro on the bottom, you can stick that on anything you want. Run the USB cable down to your USB port in your computer, and you have yourself an all-sky camera. And it's made, like I said, if the, these guys that have already bought guide scopes or guide cameras like the uh, ZWO 120 or one of these T7s, they already come with the, the lens. And I wondered why that lens was there until I started looking around, and that's exactly what they give you the supply of the lens for is if you want to use it as an all-sky camera. So there is an all-sky cam built for, well, Minus the price of the camera, it was about seven dollars for the PVC piping, <laughs> sure. and uh, the camera fits in. You know, the, it's an extra hundred or whatever you pay for the camera. But again, you can go back to using. Uh, this was a high definition webcam. It's called a Rockfish. This was very light sensitive, and that was my first all sky cam. And you'd be surprised when I was picking up the Milky Way at my place with this camera. So, but, uh, and then the software to run it. Uh, I haven't found really any free software because I love free software. Uh, but for really decent prices, <clears throat> excuse me, you can get uh, one software is called UFO Capture, and it's designed and you can manipulate it uh, every which way from Sunday to uh, be sensitive enough to pick up, say, a meteor trail, but it won't pick up an airplane flying overhead or it won't pick up a bird flying over top. So you don't end up with, 
you know, megabytes of, of uh, AVI files of really nothing here, trying to, you know, get it down to a specific meteorite or something like that. Uh, SharpCap, which a lot of us have been using for doing astrophotography, surprisingly enough, I searched around today, and it runs on a Python script, and you can go into the scripting section, and there are guys out there now that have designed all this Python script. You can copy and paste it in, and it will set up your camera to come on at a certain time, shut off at a certain time if you choose to just run it at night only. Uh, uh, sets up for a certain sensitivity in the sky, and uh, it's getting better and better, but it's free Python script that you can actually run in SharpCap and use SharpCap as an all -sky, your all-sky software, which I thought was pretty cool. And then there's another one out there called Handy AVI, which uh, to me was the simplest. Again, it's a it, not too expensive. I think it was run for the the uh, the ultimate version, which is uh, gives you manipulation every which way from Sunday. Runs about fifty nine dollars. Uh, it again, it's designed to be an all sky camera software. Um, then you know if once you get I, I myself I use it instead of just necessarily looking for meteorites and things like that. I use it as a cloud camera. If I'm at work and the fog rolls in, uh, I could use my phone, look up my PC at home, check the all-sky cam, and I can see if the fog has hit where I live. Nine times out of ten, it hasn't. And I know, you know something, I'm going home happy because I can open my roof tonight as opposed <laughs> to sitting in the middle of a fog bank. So that's why I call it, a, you know, the, the cloud camera because it tells me what, you know, what the weather's like at home when I'm at work, and I think it's the coolest thing. I went one step further, like I always do. I built uh, another all sky camera. This is a little bit more towards the 360 or 180 degree field of view from horizon to horizon. Uh, this was a security, uh, very light sensitive security camera uh, that I bought out of England. I think it, if you know what Lux means, it was a 0 0.000005 Lux is what it picks up for light, which basically means from, I think, three miles away, it'll pick up a candlelight. Uh, it's it's so sensitive. And uh, that was uh, the one that I had hooked to my observatory before I tore my uh, outriggers and everything down to put new outriggers on. And I intend to get this one put back up there. But uh, it's basically the same thing. The only thing is this one doesn't run off a USB camera. It runs off a CCD camera. So I have to have a, a card that converts the signal. This plugs into a, a card that goes into the back of my PC, and then that converts the signal as, as opposed to being on USB. It uh, runs off 12 volts, and it runs off an AV plug. So that's the only difference, really, in the cameras. But uh, <coughs> excuse me. as you can see, you can build yourself an all sky cam pretty cheap and pretty easy, uh, you know, if you're in, like Paul and I end up somehow having extra cameras, uh, you might as well convert one and throw it into an all sky cam for your, your observatory or just uh, to have outside your house. It's kind of fun to, to see what goes on at night when you're sleeping. So. Absolutely. Those shooting stars, like you say, or those Starlink uh, passes over, it would be great as well. Yeah, you can record them. So it's a kind of a neat thing to have, even at star parties. Like uh, this one, uh, I basically made it to go on the back of my trailer. I open the door, stick it up on a on a Velcro pad, and it comes down and plugs into my laptop, and it gives me an all sky cam that's running the whole time, we're at the star parties and stuff. And I wait till I get home to go through the footage and see if I catch anything. And 90% of the time, I don't, but at least I can still see the night sky. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I have done, though, is taken the footage, put it all together, and made little time lapses of the night sky, which is the same kind of thing. You watch the Milky Way rotate in the sky. And it's uh, it's pretty cool. Kind of like the cattail going for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's, a, that's a quick and simple and easy way to build yourself an all sky camera, a part sky camera, you know, a, a cloud camera, and uh, get some enjoyment that way as well for viewing. So. Thanks, Mike. A um, couple of things here. Um, I'll go to the one set on a serious note. Has anyone tried this setup using an HDMI capture card? with a more high-end video camera or any real benefit to that kind of setup? I uh, haven't used, well, HDMI to USB from my DSLR is as close as I come. Okay. Um, T, uh, 60D is an HDMI out. And then that uh, that 
you know, uh, uh, buy the adapter to go to USB, but I don't know if it's USB three, so you might be still getting high def. I'm not really sure, but that's as close as I've ever come to using anything that's. Yeah. I wonder too if um, if there'd be any benefit because it's such a low resolution uh, image because it's such a wide angle and you're so far away. Really, all you want is light sensitivity hmm. so that you can see the streaks. And then, like you said, Mike, uh, you can set it up for different. Uh, variations of light sensitivity. So you're really not going to get anything close enough that high resolution, unless you're zooming way, way in, um, that it would be that much of a benefit, I don't think. But that, that's just a thought, you know. Yeah. Well, that was, that's my son, my stepson being a little bit of a smart ass. So, because his real question was, uh, what what did you do to, uh, the, what did you buy to replace the candy trays? <laughs> <laughs> For the missus. <laughs> no candy. <laughs> I want to die, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mike. Um, so oh, I have I... a question for Mike, if I could. Okay, sure. Um, what about the heat in the daytime? Is that a, does that hurt the camera? It, it hasn't. Uh, I've had no ill effect. If anything, uh, especially in the wintertime, the if it heats up inside, it helps. It yeah. turns off and, and keeps I was thinking warm. more in the summer, like, like especially the way that it's been. But uh, I haven't, uh, you know, what, what do we get here on a hot day? That the most hot is, what, 30, 31 degrees on a super hot day? Yeah. And yeah. no effects, no ill effects whatsoever. And you've used one for quite a while, so you yeah. seem to perfect at your cameras, eh? No, it just sits out there in the weather and does its thing. Okay. Uh, hasn't affected the camera at all. As long as you're, you know, you're, the amount you're putting it in is basically sealed to keep any any water out of it, uh, you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I've seen guys build them with a webcam pointed down at a half moon uh, chrome uh, hubcap. And that gives them the 180 degree feel oh. of view. <laughs> and I see is a stick in the middle, and that's that's their basically their uh, their setup. And the camera's pointed down at it, so if it's raining and stuff, it doesn't affect the camera. It just falls on the half moon hubcap and yeah. falls away. But and then you go, that's kind of crazy because you know how how good would the focus and stuff be? But surprisingly enough, uh, for what you're using it for, uh, it's pretty darn good. You get a, a nice image out of it. Oh, that's weird. I like it. That's All cool. right, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Okay, um, Paul, I guess you're up next. Do you want to do a segment or uh, what are you going well, to I can do. Uh, I can do. Um, I wanted to read that thing from last week. Right. And it's not that long. It's it's what it is. It's a book that I got that I've been using in my. I got a little room that I use for um, this this stuff. And uh, and I do all my pictures processing and all that stuff. And the desk I had before didn't have a long enough thing to stick out, so I use this book. Some of my pictures can see myself there. Where's my mouse? There I am. So I use the book and uh, as a thing to put because I hold out one of the drawers, set it on the top, and that's what I use for a mouse pad <laughs> for a couple of years. And then I didn't even realize what kind of book was. So the book is called. Um, other worlds and it's the images of the cosmos from earth and space and it's not it's a national geographic book but it uh it has a forward in it from david levy and i think most of us online here know who david levy is if you don't he's uh the great common hunter from the was it shoe the um the the uh the comet the one that he's famous for shoemaker levy nine that hit yeah. levy, that's the one thank you but he's the, he's he's discovered a number of them is but that was his most the most famous one anyway so he writes the forward in this particular book and I and I read it and I thought well it's pretty inspiring so it's just a short it's only a paragraph and a half so so I'll read this so it's called uh, on uh, of space and time and by by David Levy um, with its moons and planets and multitude of stars the night sky frees our imminent our imaginations to wonder <coughs> how many distant stars and galaxies are out there. How many other worlds? Are we alone with Earth, the only planet blessed with life? My lifelong career as a serious stargazer began in the summer of 1960 when I was uh, when I was 12 years old, and it was helped out helped on uh, its course by the gift of a wristwatch. Uh, as my eyes followed the movement of the second hand and, uh, and for hours on the of the watch, my mind left Earth to imagine the great timepiece of the solar system. Um, and with the planets racing around the sun uh, in a clockwise 
was clockwise precision. As I began to grasp the awesome inf inf infinity of space and time that it is the cosmos, I thought about how tired that little watch would have been if it had marked the time since the universe began and its hands whirling around and around for perhaps 10 million years. Watches and telescopes are vital to astronomers. Um, for one thing, modern science sees space and time as dual manifestations of the same thing. Clocks measure time and time measures space, especially astronomical space. We calculate distances between stars and galaxies in terms of light years. The distance the light travels in one year, about six trillion miles. Because light takes time to travel um, years, the distance uh, or watching the night sky is also a voyage backward in time. The further a star is from us, the longer the light takes to reach us. Therefore, what we see today actually happened long, long time ago. My first telescope was a modest one packing a mere 3.5 inch mirror. But to me, it was the powerhouse mightier, even in the famous 200 inch behemoth atop the California's Polymer Mountain, for it was accessible to me. Just as Polymer helped out the universe to astronomers, that small scope enabled a boy on the edge of his teenhood to enjoy us and celebrate the night sky. I remember the anticipation I felt as, uh, as I assembled it. That evening, the deepening sky quickly filled with innumerable twinkling points of light, all of them beckoning for a closer look. So no star, I had no star chart back then, so I just chose one of the brighter objects uh, up, up above the trees to the south. I focused the eyepiece and watched spellbound as a marvelously striped ball surrounded by four stars took shape. Even at the age 12, I knew that I had stumbled upon the solar system's largest planet, Jupiter, accompanied by its four largest moons and the most visible ones. Night after night, I would gaze again on Jupiter, watching those moons march around and around, keeping time much like the hands of a wristwatch. I didn't know it, but back in those earlier days of personal discovery, neither my telescope nor polymers was able to detect a certain sort of satellite that hovered near the, earth, near the planet. For while Jupiter's biggest moons take only f only days or weeks to complete a revolution, this is this one circuited the planet just once every two years. And while all of Jupiter's 16 moons, large and small, moved in stable circular orbits, this one worked its way around the planet in the narrow and elongated loops. Some 30 years <clears throat> in 1993, I was searching for a sky for asteroids and comets with two other uh, veteran stargazers, Gene Shoemaker, the astronomer and geologist, and his wife, Carolyn, also an astronomer. I took two photographs of a particularly wide field of sky, which happened to include Jupiter. As I carefully got at the scope, I recalled my first glimpse of this planet with many years ago before. I had, um, a lot had happened since 1960, yet I was still watching the sky each night, and Jupiter's moons were still orbiting the planet exactly as they always had. And it goes on to talk about uh, how he discovered um, the Shoemaker-Levy uh, comet. and But just reading that um, um, forward that uh, David Levy wrote, a lot of us started the same way. You know, we had something that just told us, you know, what what's out there? You know, maybe I should get a telescope and take a look around. And again, like myself and like David, I didn't start with a sky chart. I just did stuck it on the stuck it on the uh, the pad out back and started looking around and you know find look something in the sky. Oh, what's that up there? And pointed at it and and it's just kind of where you all get started when you buy a new telescope. So, um, but the but the, his childhood um, memories never left him. And even today, and David's not a young man anymore, but he still has that same enthusiasm as that little wristwatch uh, gave him when he started back when he was 12 years old. So yeah. anyway, that was the reading I want to uh, read tonight. That's cool. Nice. Yeah. Well, thanks a bunch. Yeah. I think it brings us all back to that moment we looked in the eyepiece for the first time. Went, oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that wow moment, even before the Saturn's rings. Yeah. <laughs> yep, absolutely, 100%. Saturn's rings was the, was the topper though for sure. Hard oh, to get away from that one, and, yeah, and it still is. And still is. That's a wild moment. Yeah, that one in the moon. <laughs> um, so, did you want to do a Rosanna's fun facts tonight, or are we gonna? What do you think? Um, no, actually, you can go ahead and do your thing, and if there's any time after, fine. We'll not. Well, I'll use it next week. Okay, I was just gonna do a bit of the night sky this week, I guess. So, just a quick talk on that. Won't be much. Uh, let's see if I can get things. Shift it around here a bit. I'm going to try to share my screen again. And 
I'll go to this one. So all I really did uh, with this one was um, brought up our Stellarium map. Of course, Stellarium is a is a free program uh, that you can download from Stellarium.org. Um, once you download it, all you do is go in uh, to the side menu here. You choose your location uh, from this menu here. In my case, I type St. John, or you can get it from your network connection, and it'll set up the sky as it is at the moment for you. So there's our sky this evening. Um, of course, tonight we've got our full moon. I'm going to spin it over to our eastern sky. I'm going to maybe move the time ahead just a bit, say an hour or so. Let's go. Let's go to 10:30 because we're just starting to rise here now. And if we zoom in a little bit closer here, look at what we got here in our sky. So we've got our, our rising full moon, because it was full this morning actually at about uh, 1.44 Atlantic time. And of course last night uh, we had the penumbra lunar eclipse, so not sure if anybody caught that or not. Um, but we weren't able to get it here at all because of the fog nebula that sends a rise in here. Whenever there's a, a, a nice event going on, we always seem to have fog. No, I don't know what we're like out there tonight, Mike. It looks like a cloud tonight, so yeah, we'll probably miss this one too. <laughs> anyway, apparently so this is what does happen. <laughs> you were saying something? Sorry? I said it's just the way it is. Just the way it is. Buy all the equipment, get it all set up, and then clouds. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. Every so, time. yeah. All, like, we, we get to see a whole lot of uh, scenes like this from somebody else <laughs> that took pictures. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So tonight, though, we've got Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon all really nice together. If I bring on uh, the uh, distance chart here, I think it's this one. I can actually plot this to the center of the Moon there. We're only looking at about uh, 4 degrees or so. I think that's what that's what that is. There's only yeah, 2 degrees, 3 degrees right there to the center. So you can almost get all of these in a field of view of binoculars, which is pretty incredible to see two planets and the Moon. Uh, very nicely, tightly uh, bound together there like that. Now, of course, Jupiter, if we click on Jupiter and we uh, happen to zoom in on it, well, we won't do that because we'll get rid of this first. Okay, now we can go back. And as we zoom in, even with a small telescope, you're going to get a view somewhat like uh, maybe this with a uh, giant Jupiter here at the center, and we've got uh, three moons, it looks like, Callisto, Europa, uh, Io and Ganymede are on the other side, so we've, uh, and that's the same view that Galileo would have gotten over 400 years ago through his tiny telescope, but even the smallest telescopes and even binoculars will give you this view. Uh, so don't forget to take a look at binoculars, there are two telescopes joined together basically, uh, 10 by 50 binoculars, 10 times magnification, 50 millimeter optical uh, end on them, and that'll give you this view um, right, right here through binoculars. Uh, of course, larger, the larger the telescope, the closer you're going to get, and you're going to get in to see the, here we are tonight with a great red spot sitting right there, right wow. center at uh, 1030 tonight. So, nice view right there. Mm. And let's pan over a little bit, maybe to Saturn, if we bring Saturn into uh, our center field of view. I think I do this one. And zoom in on it a bit. Oop, oop, oop. Where'd you go? There you are. Try to bring up here. Dag Nabbit. Rascal Wabbit, hold still. <laughs> All right. Let's just stop the time here. So we can see that we've got our beautiful ring system here. And the tilt of the of the rings right now is about 21 degrees. Um, and uh, through the next little while, we're going to be able to see the A, B, and C ring all, all visible there because the North Pole is tilted towards us about 21 degrees right now, which is really nice. Um, not full open, but certainly enough there to, to pick up the Cassini division. This is this division here in between the ring system and uh, lots of other moons around here too. There's Rhea and uh, we've got uh, Enceladus, Tethys, Dion. We can usually pick out three or four moons uh, sitting around that beautiful golden ring here of, of Saturn. So that's always a showstopper. Uh, no matter how many times you look at Saturn, it just looks like it's a cartoon. Like it just it shouldn't exist, you know, but uh, it is an amazing uh, little little feature to watch for sure. Uh, okay, from there, uh, we might, uh, tomorrow morning actually, the moon passes about two degrees south of Saturn. So if we take that head a day, one day, not, you know, sorry, one day. No, 
I was right the other way, 7 6. There we are. And we're going to spin over to our, our uh, western sky in the morning sky. So we're going to say about uh, 5 a.m. Probably not going to catch it because daylight now comes up right around that time anyway. There's our moon, there's Saturn, there's Jupiter in our morning sky tomorrow. Um, so we still have a nice view of them uh, throughout, the, throughout the, uh, the evening, all evening long, right up till tomorrow morning for sure. Um, and Saturn will reach opposition really on July the 20th, which means that uh, we will be directly between the sun and, and Saturn. So that means Saturn's going to be up all evening long in our night sky. It's going to be at its, our, we're going to be at our, our closest approach to it. It'll be its biggest, its brightest, and the most enjoyable uh, right around that time. So it doesn't have to be on July 20th that you get out uh, from now till the end of summer, really. We're going to have real nice views of, of Jupiter and Saturn both. Jupiter, I believe, is at opposition around the, uh, around the 14th of the month. Now, morning sky. Uh, if I can, spin over to our eastern morning sky. And we're going to be looking for Venus, so I don't know if we're going to find it this late in the morning. But we'll type it in here anyway. Yep, right up there in Taurus. Look at it. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's going to be at its brightest, actually, um, uh, next week. Oops. Yeah, we went to 4 o'clock. So there it is. There's 4.35 on uh, Tuesday, I guess. Today's the 5th, yes, yeah, so it'll be Tuesday. Sitting right in Taurus, really nice, and look, just 12 degrees above uh, Venus, and there's a nice Pleiades star cluster. The sign of fall, guys, here it comes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Taurus, and then who's up behind that? The Ryan, of course, and, and there's Auriga, which is where we're going to be looking for the comet right now. So uh, from the comets list, um, I'm going to go over because I already read, I already loaded in the comets list. But if you have Stellarium, how to find uh, the, the comet itself? It's not necessarily going to pop up for you. You're going to go down here to your configuration window. When you bring up configuration, you're going to go over to plugins. Once you're in plugins, you're going to go down to uh, Solar System Editor. Click on Solar System Editor. And then you're going to say conf uh, configure that. In here. You've got options to choose. Uh, you're going to go um, import and replace the solar uh, system minor objects from a file. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not it. Just a second. Export solar system. No, no. Hang on. Solar system button. Ah, that's it. We're going to click on solar system button. Then we're going to say import orbital elements in MPC format. So when we do that, we're going to say, it's going to ask you, do you want to choose asteroids or comets? In this case, we want comets. And we're going to say, get orbital elements. And it's going to load all of the current um, comets in the list. From the, orbit, no, download, I'm sorry, download a list of objects from the internet. There we go, sorry. And the bookmark is called the MPC's List of Observable Comets. You can always back up on this and, and get it again. Then we're going to get the orbital elements. They're all in there now. These are all the ones that we want. Let's say Mark All and Add Objects. But down that list would be um, would be uh, C2020 F3, it's called. So all the comets that are visible in our evening sky are all in that um, part of the plugin now. So they are now incorporated within... Stellarium. So if I go over here to the search button and I go to the comet that I wanted to bring up, uh, which I know the name of, so it's called, uh, once I get this mouse over far enough, uh, we're going to call it the C slash 2020. And then you're going to see all the C 2020s all listed there. And this one's actually called F3. And it's called Neowise. Neowise. So if I click search, it's going to bring it up. It's not there because it's 4.30 in the morning, isn't it? You're going to have to go to 5.30 in the morning. No, it was at 5.15, wasn't it? Yeah, 5.13 or something like that. 5.13. All right, we're in Auriga. I know it's and just yeah, it Auriga and the twins. Let's do it again. C2020 F3 Neolize. Click. <laughs> it 
Yeah, we can't see it right there, can we? No right. glitches today. <laughs> well, no glitches today. No, not in Solarium ever, right? This is, t I know this is t uh, Tuesday. Back to today. I know it's there. So I saw it earlier. And it's just under a rag. Well, let me do it another way. Hang on. Yeah, it was like 5.13, I think, that I saw it on my software. Let's try this way. Here's Heavens Above website. So we'll go C2020 F3 Neo Eyes right there. Brightness of magnitude 2.1. It'll show it to us where it is. So there's where it's supposed to be in a Riga right there, just below Riga, and just before the sun comes up. Right? Um, what you can do here is find that really bright star in a Riga and just drop down to about 7 o'clock position, and it should be sitting right there. Take off the name in search, Sighorn says. Just a second. Take off the name in search, okay? Let's try that. Go back to search again. 2020 F3. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Good to read your comments. Appreciate that. There it is. So there's uh, 4.30. Look at how the sun's coming up, though, huh? So 5.15, you're going to be at your highest, I guess, but you're going to be fighting the sun at this point. So you're still only going to be a few degrees above the horizon, though. Difficult target. Only 7 degrees above the horizon at 4.49. But it is there, and uh, the pictures I showed earlier... Prove that it is there, and you're going to need. So bright, eh? Hmm. Yeah. Look at how bright it is. Yeah, that early, right? So. No, I mean the comet itself. Well, the comet itself, yes. Yeah, it's supposed to be at uh, two, about magnitude two right now. So for us locally, I guess clear skies are going to be probably Tuesday morning. Um, if to pick a spot northeast, might be uh, looking from Saint Rest Beach over towards. Uh, uh, the refinery that direction or maybe up uh, top of uh, Somerset Drive Technology Drive uh, that would get you a view of the northeast but you're going to need to uh, be up fairly high I think to get uh, a low view of the northeast to be able to pick this up so but there are pictures that have been captured of it for sure so uh, it is it is possible to get and it does appear with a nice tail behind it so um, and it, it may get brighter because it's just come from around the sun at the moment uh, just on on the third so we're only talking a couple of days ago so we're hoping that it's going to brighten even more so um, predictions right now are saying that it's going to get dim <coughs> Mike you were saying I'm sorry uh, all the predictions that I got say that it's going to get start getting dimmer dimmer yeah but it's going to continue to climb too so if we if we watch it now yeah. over the next few days we'll see how it's climbing up in Auriga just making that loop so we'll have it probably till around the 17th or 18th or so depending on what brightness it'll be at that point but that's the few targets that I wanted to offer just for this week anyway um, next week we'll have some more um, nice night sky uh, activities coming up but that's all I was gonna say for tonight because I want to give Paul some time to, to uh, give another talk here so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen Paul what am I talking about I don't know <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? Pick something. <laughs> Pick something, yeah. I don't care. Oh, well, it's 9.30. I think, I think we did enough oh, talking. Yeah. Do you think we did? Okay. We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll do the Rosanna segment next week. Okay. Let me stop sharing that. Okay. We're back. Okay. So we'll do the Rosanna segment next week. Okay. Yeah, we are. Because we are getting into 9.30. Like we're one hour, 28 minutes, and 51 seconds live. And... We apologize, folks, but we're just uh, we're covering a lot more material than we had ever really expected uh, on these cloudy and uh, nights that uh, we're not able to offer anything else through live sky view. But our topics do uh, carry on a little bit longer, and but it's it's material that we want to get squeezed in as well to make sure that you that you get everything that you need to to make uh, sound decisions down the pipe. So, how does that sound, guys? We're just having so much fun. That's yeah, it. that too. Yeah. <laughs> that too. 
Okay, so that is three toads on events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go again. All right, it's back to work to me from now, so I'm not I'm not as happy as I was on my older shows. But anyway, <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, in uh, in closing tonight, then we we'd all like to uh, thank each and every one of you for your continued support of all of our efforts here. Um, I wanted to remind you all that we do love getting your photos again, so you can send them in to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, and we will put them on the next broadcast. Uh, we love getting all the photos. We'd like to talk about them. Uh, take a look at what you're, what you're taking as far as photos go. Also, if you have a topic that you'd like us to talk about on future broadcasts, please send them to the same address. Uh, we love getting your ideas for future shows as well. Uh, we'd also like to... Uh, well, I guess we're not going to, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll skip that part for this week. <laughs> We'd like to ask that if you enjoyed the content here tonight, please consider giving us a like on the episode, uh, and please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already on YouTube. And uh, we'd also like to uh, ask that you share this with your friends and family, that we are here every Sunday night live. And finally, we'd like to wish all of you a good, healthy, and safe week. Uh, we have had an opportunity, although briefly this week, to meet with a few of you again in the past week. Uh, we think our new method of offering outreach, where we uh, were offering live views to remote television, uh, is going to work out pretty well for us, we think, um, allowing us to reveal some of the night sky treasures while maintaining the health guidelines that are laid out for us all, like uh, the social distancing. And we're really looking forward to carrying on this approach uh, throughout the summer and into the fall. So stick with us. Uh, we'll get back at that very soon. So although it does appear that we're heading uh, in the right direction in this, in this uh, new normal, let's keep our guard up for now, and we will put all this behind us eventually if we just keep working together at it. So everybody, have a great week, and uh, know that we are here again to help educate and entertain you each week at the same time. So for now then, from Mike, Paul, and I, uh, stay safe, everyone. We hope you see you again here next week, and uh, as we like to say, guys, uh, keep your scopes. Point it up. Point it up. <laughs> hey, big hand. Big hand, big hand. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, back on to join us again, and we'll hopefully see you all again next week. Have a great week, folks. Take care. Right. Night.